Hello, Comic-Con. And, and welcome to Journey to Mars and the Martian. So, uh, my name is Aditya Sood. I am uh, one of the producers on the upcoming film, The Martian. Uh, and we have an incredible, incredible panel today. Really excited to, uh, to talk to you guys. Um, maybe before we kick things off, I got a little something to show you if you're interested in. We, we, should, we should cue the video. Or I can do it in charades. <laughs> You don't seem interested enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> Every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountains, people coordinate a search. If an earthquake levels the city, people all over the world send emergency supplies. This instinct is found in every culture, without exception. At around 4.30 a.m., our satellites detected a storm approaching the Ares 3 mission site on Mars. The storm had escalated to severe, and we had no choice but to abort the mission. But during the evacuation, astronaut Mark Watney was killed. <laughs> I'm entering this log for the record. This is Mark Watney. And I'm still alive. Obviously. I have no way to contact NASA or my crewmates. But even if I could, it would take four years for another manned mission to reach me. And I'm in a hab designed to last 31 days. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the sh** out of this. Okay, let's do the math. I gotta figure out how to grow four years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. Houston, be advised. We've got a video message. It's directed to the whole crew. Play it. Mein Gott. <laughs> Mark Watney is still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. We left him behind. Let's go get our boy. This is something NASA rejected. So we're talking mutiny. And if we mess up the supply rendezvous, we die. If we mess up the Earth gravity assist, we die. It doesn't cooperate. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Is it possible that he's still alive? So before we get started, I just want to say, you know, in my line of work, I get to hang out with some like pretty cool and interesting people. And I'll be honest, we get a little blase about it. And I go and I like see my cousins and they tell me like, oh my God, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, well, no, he's just like a regular. I have not been more starstruck than I was backstage with these guys because they actually do real work and truly, truly amazing things. So you guys are in for a real treat today. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, all right, so let me introduce our panel. Um, first, uh, Jim Green, uh, the director of planetary science for NASA. Um, he's in charge of planetary exploration. Uh, he's a Mars expert. 
He was also a technical consultant on The Martian and helped us in ways you cannot even possibly imagine. Um, and, um, and he, uh, you know, he is basic. I, I, by the way, he also doesn't just do Mars. He does pretty much the entire solar system. And I, I know I promised him I would just keep it to Mars, but he's also involved with uh, the Pluto flyby. Maybe some of you guys have heard. Um, and we have Todd May. Uh, Todd is, um, he's just building the next uh, spaceship that's actually going to take us to Mars. Uh, you guys may have heard of it. It's the Space Launch System. Um, he is, uh, I mean, it, it's incredible. What, and he'll, he'll tell you more about it, but the SLS, when it's completed, is actually going to be more powerful than the Saturn V rocket. Uh, and then we have Victor Glover. Gl Victor Glover, as of yesterday, is an astronaut. Official. <laughs> And he's, and he's, if he and the members of his class aren't just any astronauts, they are actually the class that most likely will be among the first people to walk on Mars. Uh, and finally, we have Andy Weir, uh, the author of The Martian. Or, or as I like to say, the guy who got us into this mess. <laughs> um, and Andy, you know, is, besides being an amazing guy, is an amazing novelist, and I think has created something that, you know, not, well, already as a book, is going to be an all-time classic, and hopefully we've done him proud uh, with, with our film. <laughs> um, all right, so let's start. Um, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about Mars? Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> you know, uh, what I'd like to do, since Mars is one of our destinations beyond low Earth orbit, we'll go to this planet. It's a beautiful planet. And as Andy has glimpsed into the near future and, and shown us what humans can do, I want to give you a little background about Mars. So if you want to go to Mars, yeah, then you need to learn to be a Martian. So in the few minutes I have, I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about this beautiful planet, this beautiful red planet. This, of course, is what it looks like today. It's very arid. It has a very small atmosphere, only about a uh, percent or so of the Earth's atmosphere. It's not like ours. It's primarily carbon dioxide, but it has a whole series of trace gases. And we've been examining Mars for more than 50 years now with a whole series of probes. Now, as you know, we have two rovers that are actively working right now on the surface, Opportunity and Curiosity. And they are finding amazing things. Curiosity is sitting in an ancient riverbed, a place that we now know that tells us a lot about Mars's past. Because three and a half billion years ago, Mars looked like this. It looked much more Earth-like than it, than it ever did in its history. This environment could have been habitable. It had a significant amount of water. In fact, the northern hemisphere was probably more than half ocean. This is an enormous change in, in the environment that it occurred over time. And our spacecraft are indeed looking at it to try to determine how this happened. So where did the water go? What indeed happened to Mars over time? Let me see if I can get the next one. Here we go. Well, the water not only evaporated away, but it also went underground. And what we're looking at is four images over a Mars year looking down the side of a crater. And what I want to point out are these long, what look like um, linear streaks that come out. And they come out during the summer. And what that is, it's water, we believe, briny water, coming out of aquifers after the sun has heated the plug of water that's holding it back 
sublimating it away, and water is pouring down the sides of these craters. We find this in Valles Marineris. We find it in many other locations on Mars. So indeed, Mars was a very wet environment in the past, and it has a significant amount of water in the future for us to be able to use. And that's the really good thing. So when humans go to Mars, rather than bringing all their water, we'll tell them, bring a straw, because we know where to go, <laughs> and we can get it. So here's a topographical map of Mars. In the bluish area are the low areas. This is where, indeed, the water oceans would be. And in fact, where the, where the blue and the green meets, these are the shores, the ancient shores where clays are found and where perhaps life started about three and a half billion years ago. We don't know that for a fact, but we would love to find that out and our missions are, are indeed making progress in this area. The only two that are operating right now, of course, are in the blue, they're Opportunity and Curiosity and these are the locations that they are. Now, Andy's book uh, takes place uh, north of where Pathfinder is, in that bluish area. So Ares III was sitting in the ancient ocean floor of Mars. And of course, um, uh, that's a beautiful area to be at because there are also resources. There's water underground in that particular area. So quite a beautiful area. Curiosity, when it landed, it took its hand lens and took 54 images of itself. And of course, what that meant was it created its first selfie, <laughs> posted it on its Facebook website, <clears throat> and so we all could enjoy it. But it moved on, and of course, it, it looked at the soils. It has some of the most advanced astrobiological instruments we've ever launched. And when it drilled into the soils, what it found was not red Mars, it was gray Mars. It, it told us about the past of Mars. And what did it find? It found carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur. Those were all the basic ingredients to life. So this area, like the Earth, three and a half billion years ago, could have started life. So this is a fabulous planet to explore and to uh, uh, continue to do our science in. Currently, our orbiters, as you can see here, we have quite a few that are operating, some from the European Space Agency. We have another one called MOM, which is also from the Indian Space Agency. But we have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and we have Mars uh, Express. Uh, and of course, now, as you can see, we have uh, Opportunity and Curiosity. What we're going to launch next year are two major missions. One is InSight. It's going to get down. It's not a rover. It will sit down on the ground of Mars and will make seismic measurements. We want to know how active the planet is. Are there Mars quakes? We can, from orbit, observe avalanches going on on Mars. What is the cause of that? Is the, is the interior of the planet still very active that do produce Mars quakes, or is it because of impacts from the nearby uh, asteroid belt that sometimes impacts Mars itself? Then, of course, we have uh, our upcoming rovers. ESA has what's called ExoMars, but we have the rover called Mars 2020 that we're currently building right now. Now, in the book, Andy, used this beautifully, indeed, in terms of the orbiters that were there, and used that basic infrastructure that we have, and really brought us uh, that immediate imagination as to what we might be doing on the surface of Mars. Here is that upcoming rover called Mars 2020 that we're building. What's really great about this is we have a Norwegian uh, instrument underneath the pan of the, of the rover that is a uh, ground penetrating radar. It's going to be looking for those aquifers. But in addition to that, we have perhaps our first human exploration instrument, and it is called MOXIE. And let me show uh, uh, an image of MOXIE. If I could, here we go. Uh, as you can see, it's not a very large instrument, but what it does is it brings in that CO2 and it pops off an oxygen. And it, for the first time, as Andy points out in the book, is an oxygenator. 
And so these are the kind of things that we want to learn how to use and do on Mars for us to be able to, in the long run, make it there. So what is the plan? To go to Mars, it takes science, it takes exploration, and it takes technology. In low Earth orbit, we're doing a number of things right now with space station. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the Kelly brothers that is on station right now that is staying for a year, because that's approximately the time it will take to go to Mars and learn to be able to work and live in space over that long period of time. Uh, we also have the SLS that we are currently building. That is the rocket that will take humans there. And we need a lot of equipment and support capability to go there. But indeed, we also are going to continue on with our with our scientific experiments, our scientific robots, if you will. So when humans are on Mars, they will not only be communicating with those orbiting assets that we have there, but they'll have their pet rovers, like Curiosity, alongside them making measurements as we go along. And so indeed, this is our future, and the evolution of a Martian starts from exploring it with our robotics and onto on to our human explorers. And so with that, Todd. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hey, I, I'll just tell you guys, it is, I am so geeked out about being out here and being on a stage that, that with, with Andy Weir, and the Diada suit, the guys that wrote The Martian, and then, and then Leonard Neboin's son was just up here. You see my shirt? <laughs> it actually says Turkey. I thought it said Trekkie when I bought it. <laughs> um, I, so you heard a lot about the robotic program. Um, I, I'll humanize it a little bit for you, and then, of course, Victor's going to make it even uh, more humanized for you. There, there's actually a, a little part in, in Andy's book um, and I won't give away any details, but where they say all over the earth they gathered. There was an event and people gathered all over the earth. This, this photograph was taken uh, in Saigon shortly after Neil Armstrong and Buzz landed uh, on the moon. And, and the reason I'm showing it because um, I got a chance, I actually was sitting console for the Phoenix lander mission back in a previous life. And Buzz Aldrin spoke that night, and, and he talked about coming back from the moon and getting papers from around the world that said, we did it. It didn't say Buzz did it, Neil did it, the Americans did it. It said we, the human race. And, um, and, and again, without saying too much about the book, there's a theme in there about humankind and the human spirit. Um, but uh, that was the moon, and uh, at some point here in the near future, if this clicker will work, <laughs> Click. Click. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we're going to see this on Mars. Um, I love this picture because it was painted by a scientist, a uh, friend of mine, Dr. Dan Durda from Southwest Research Institute, and he's a geologist. Uh, one of the things you'll learn about Mark Watney, the hero of the Martian, um, is that he was a botanist. And so the idea of a scientist and exploration and science working together, you, you actually saw in that picture that Jim just showed the intertwining of technology, exploration, and science together. Um, we use engineering and technology um, to make the machines, but we use our scientific minds uh, like geology and scientists to discover. Um, it is great to work for a space agency, and, and the three of us do here, whose mission statement is to reach new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn can benefit all mankind. Um, that is not, I guarantee you, that's not what's over the door of the Postal Service. <laughs> um, and, and so this idea of what we do being for all of us here, for all of you, for all of us. And, um, and so, yes, we're going to Mars. Uh, I actually had an astronaut who, who, uh, who, who said something to me a couple days ago. Uh, and he said it in front of a bunch of people, so I'll say it again. He says, I was in the White House a few days ago, and the president said, we're going to Mars. Right. Um, that's a pretty cool thing to hear. Different aspect. And, and we are. And, and, and as Jim said, um, there's a whole bunch of things that, that work together to get us there. 
Um, I'll talk about this chart slightly differently, and that is that the left side here is kind of um, Earth dependent. Uh, we have humans in orbit today. They've been up there for uh, more than a decade, uh, but we're hours away from Earth if we need to get home. Mars, you're gonna be months or over a year. You're, you're gonna be Earth independent, and that is a hard thing to do. And, and as you know from the book, once you get there, it's also very hard to get home. But in the middle, in the middle ground in there is what we call the proving ground, um, where you're not quite Earth independent, but you're not quite Earth dependent. You're in an area where you could come back in days or weeks. Um, and so the SLS, when it first launches, is gonna be launching into the cislunar space. The first time we put humans on it, the second flight, we're actually gonna set a distance record. We'll go out in the deep retrograde orbit on the back side of the moon, and we'll be out in that proving ground area once again. And then from there, we put all those building blocks that Jim talked about together to get folks to Mars. But if you're gonna send a, a human to Mars, um, rovers uh, are fairly needy. You know, They need a couple hundred watts of power, but if we're gonna send Victor and some of his friends to Mars for a long period of time, uh, they need a lot of stuff. And, um, and if you're gonna take a lot of stuff out into deep space and into Mars, you're gonna need a large capable ship to be able to get you out there. Um, I literally um, left. We were in the middle of our final design review of the Space Launch System this week. I will chair a board in about a week and a half and we will say we are go for design certification phase. Uh, we are building it uh, as we speak today. The rocket you see before you. Uh, the rocket you see before you has the brand new Orion capsule, which uh, you may have seen in December, launched aboard a Delta IV to get a test flight under its belt. Uh, the boosters on the side look a lot like the solid rockers, uh, boosters from the shuttle program. They are, except they've got an extra segment, so they've got about 25% more power, 3.5 million pounds of thrust coming out of those things. Uh, the engines on the bottom are the RS-25 engines. They're essentially engines that actually have flown on the shuttle before. We have 16 of them in our fleet. Uh, they are proven engines. These things are Ferraris. Uh, 18, uh, the equivalent of 18 Hoover dams coming out of the bottom of that. They can empty a swimming pool in 25 seconds. <laughs> they're, they're made out of materials like Monel and Inconel that can go from cryogenic temperatures to 6,000 degrees in half a second. Um, we are actually starting to make these rocket parts now out of, of course, everybody's been hearing about 3D printing. We call it selective laser melting. We're actually, <laughs> you know, we have to, have to put a NASA name on it. <laughs> um, but we're making rocket parts now um, on 3D printers, which is pretty amazing. That's part of what makes this thing more affordable than we've been in the past. The center you see there, the core, that's a 27 and a half foot core. It's made with friction stir welding machines down in Michu. Uh, we have the world's largest friction stir welder. It's over 200 feet tall, um, and it is accurate to within two ten thousandths of an inch. We can pop these things out off of just six machines. We make, we make the core structure. Um, and then on top of that, you see the ICPS in between the Orion and that core stage. That's essentially a Delta IV upper stage. By the time we get to the second launch, we may go ahead and put the upper stage on it. Once we do that, we're gonna have a rocket that is more powerful than the Saturn V and can put 40 metric tons into cislunar space. Thank you. <clears throat> and since this is Comic Con, <laughs> Okay, there's a little shout out. Um, actually though, what, what you need to know about this stuff, I've kind of hinted at it. Um, this is real hardware. Um, we have uh, about 60% of the articles um, at Mishu, these big giant pieces you see on the right of the core stage, the flight units, we have all the qualification units, all the Pathfinder units already built, all the rings, all the dome segments. Uh, as I said, this, we have 16 flight engines ready to go. On the left there, we've actually tested um, the new motor um, four times now, three development motor firings and one qualification motor firing. We've got one more qual motor firing, then it's on to build in the flight unit. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a quick video here real, and get you a little excited about this thing and then I'm out. T minus 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, 
one. It's actually louder than that in person, I imagine. <laughs> it is. We like our smoke and fire. <laughs> so I will say that Annie's book kind of starts, you know, and you, you've already got them on Mars. And, and if you've ever read Failure is Not an Option, it's kind of the first chapter is like, and then one day a rocket appears and then the hard stuff begins. I, I want to let you guys know there are folks, uh, thousands of people in 46 states around this country that are assembling this rocket today. And, um, and they have their pocket protectors and they have their calculators and they're checking it twice. And, uh, and we're getting this rocket ready for Victor. <laughs> that'll right. hand it off. Right. So Victor, I wanna ask the most important question. Are you going to be the first man on Mars? <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> God, seriously, yeah. get your photos now. This is like a Babe Ruth rookie card. <laughs> <laughs> well, t tell us a little bit about, you know, about the astronaut training and, and how, how do you even prepare for going a place that no one has, has ever gone before, to coin a phrase? <laughs> First of all, can we give a shout out to the sound guy? Because that was... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm going to answer your question and get to the, the astronaut training stuff. But I mean, how amazing is it? We're in one of the most beautiful cities in America. The weather is great, but we're in here. The room is packed. Fred Flintstone is here. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a ninja turtle out there somewhere, too. Uh, and we're here talking about going to Mars. I mean, that, it's amazing. That's amazing. And so Fred's excited about that. And Fred is happy. Fred, as well. Fred's worked up. Yeah, but that would do. It's, it's, <laughs> this is amazing. It's great to be here. And um, you know, I haven't been with NASA that long. Uh, next month will be two years. So we just finished astronaut candidate training. Actually, yesterday our class, the eight of us, uh, the 2013 astronaut candidate class, was officially pinned astronauts. And so we have eight new astronauts on Team America. And um, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's. That's pretty neat. And uh, just today, <laughs> and just today, they announced the names of the first astronauts to fly on the commercial crew vehicles. And that's very important, bringing the launch capability back to American soil, getting astronauts to the, to the space station. Yeah. All amazing things, and we're doing all of this stuff. Uh, and then Todd's gonna get us out beyond low Earth orbit. And uh, those missions fit together, they work together, to all towards getting us going to Mars. What we do is train to work and live in space, whether it's in low, low Earth orbit or on the way to the moon to test out the, the systems, that proving ground that's gonna get us, we gotta go halfway to Mars before we go all the way to Mars. And so our job is to, to get good at working and living in space. And you know, it's amazing that uh, living on the space station for over a decade, you know, it's been manned for 15 years. 
and we're still learning things, and we will until that system's no longer in use. We're learning to use it more effectively as a national laboratory. The science that's going on up there is invaluable. We're learning things about basic physics. You know, water droplets form differently up there, and mist behaves differently up there, and when you burn materials, combustion happens differently up there, and we're learning things about basic elements, things that we take for granted, watching a fire burn here on Earth. And so learning to use that system more effectively is feeding into our ability to develop systems and to, to understand the, the effects of long duration spaceflight on the human body. And that's probably the most important thing because uh, you ask these smart guys to my right and this smart guy to my left, he understands it as well. The weak link in the chain is us. We are the hard thing to get to Mars. We're already there with robots, with instruments in space, but to put us there is a challenge and we understand that. And there's a lot we have to learn about how we can get us there. And so, you know, we, uh, we have a very unique office. We've got folks from all different kinds of backgrounds. I'm a military pilot. I was, I was office mates with this really amazing engineer that every time I speak to him, it makes me want to go home and pick up my calculus book and study. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I have a conversation with him, I walk away from him and I close the door and I just go, man, I just had a conversation where the guy says, you know, that one time I was in space, uh, one of the smartest guys that I know. And uh, it's amazing that we're talking about working and living in space. And it, it wasn't until I showed up at NASA that I realized that we've done that. We've done that for over a decade. We live there. We are out there. And it's, you know, Mark Kelly is up there right now on that one-year mission, helping us get better at living and working in space. And uh, it's amazing. And we'll talk some more about those things in detail. But, you know, it's just amazing. And I'm new, so this is still cool to me. I, I, <laughs> I can't believe I'm actually really sitting here talking to you about flying in space. It's amazing. All right, Andy, first of all, congratulations on the success of the book. By Thank the way, you. the number one New York Times bestseller last week. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, don't know, I don't know how many, how many of you guys have read the book? Come on. All right, how many of you guys are going to read the book after this panel? I, I don't know how, how see much some you sales know about there. this. Huh? I see some sales there. It's looking good. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the story behind the book, but I will tell you, it is almost or maybe even more uh, exciting than Mark Watney's journey of how, Andy, how you took, I mean, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how all right. this all came about? Well, these are pretty tough act to follow here. We've got, uh, we've got like, makes blockbuster movies, makes space probes, makes rockets, flies rockets, Sometimes I put pants on during the day to write. Sometimes, no. So yeah, I'm glad I could follow you four. <laughs> um, the story behind the story on the Martian is kind of, uh, you know, as, as Aditya says, a, a story in itself. Um, I, I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a kid, but I also like eating regular meals and I don't want to live under an overpass. So when the time came to choose a profession, I ended up being a computer programmer, which I like and, I'm, and I was good at, well, eventually. <laughs> and um, to, to give you an indication of how long I was programming computers, I was one of the programmers on Warcraft 2. <laughs> that's, that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, as time went on, I, uh, I, I did get, uh, at one point I, I worked for AOL and I got laid off. And um, along with 800 of my closest friends when they merged with Netscape, once again, revealing how old I am. Um, and uh, it ended up being a really good severance package because I had stock options and I was forced to sell them because I'd been laid off. I had something like 60 days to sell them. So I just sold them. And that turned out to be AOL's all-time high stock price. <laughs> so I assure you I would not have made a wise financial decision left to my own devices but events conspired. So I had some money and I said like, oh, I'm gonna spend, uh, I'm gonna take my shot. I'm gonna try to be a full-time author, okay. So I took three years off, or rather just didn't go look for another job for three years. <laughs> and I wrote a book. And that book is not The Martian. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Uh, I, and it's the standard story for authors. Couldn't get an agent, couldn't get any publishers interested. Wasn't that great a book. It was actually my second book. My first book really sucked. That was, I wrote that in college before the days of the internet, so it doesn't exist out in the digital realm, thank God. But anyway, um, so uh, after three years, I, I, I went back to work as a software engineer. That wasn't a big failure for me because I, I liked doing it. And I decided I'll do writing as a hobby. The internet was just starting to come into its own. People could have their own websites. And I thought, okay, here's an avenue where I can write, I can have an audience, and I don't need to get published or anything. I mean, I'm, it's not going to be a profession, but it'll be a hobby. So I spent the next 10 years writing. I uh, made a webcomic called Casey and Andy, I made another webcomic called Cheshire Crossing, and then I made a whole bunch of uh, narrative short fiction. Uh, I made one short story called The Egg that a lot of you may have heard of. Dead silence. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> I did make a story called The Egg. Um, and I also uh, was writing um, three different serials at the same time, where I would just post chapters to my website one at a time. One of them was about a mermaid living <laughs> in uh, the 19th century uh, in, uh, in New England. Another one is, was like hardcore sci-fi about aliens and telepaths and stuff like that. And the third one was The Martian. So I was posting The Martian chapter by chapter to my website when I felt like it. I got feedback from my readers. I had about 3,000 regular readers at that time, based on the size of my mailing list. And they're all hardcore nerds, like me. And uh, so they would, whenever there was anything wrong in the book, anything scientifically inaccurate, they'd be like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so I called them beta readers because they would find all the bugs, and it was great. I could go back and fix things. And also getting all the feedback helped really motivate me to finish it up. So when I finished, I figured like, okay, I'm done. No big deal. Um, I I've, I've finished this book, now I'm gonna go work on my other serials. And I started to get email from people saying, hey, I, 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 love your, uh, I love The Martian, but I hate reading it on your website, which is reasonable because my website sucks. And, <laughs> and is, can, can you make an e-reader version? So I went ahead and did that. I made an e-reader version and I posted it to my site and said, there you go, there's an EPUB version and a Mobi version. Every e-reader reads at least one of those. Knock yourself out. Then I got other emails. Hey Andy, uh, I love that there's a, an e-reader e version available, but I'm not very technically savvy, and I just don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it on my e-reader. Can you just put it up on Kindle? So I figured out how to do that. It's pretty easy. Uh, you just go to Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP is what I used. Um, you, you can post it up there. They hold on to it for 24 hours just to have a human look at it to make sure you're not posting a bunch of goat porn. But <laughs> <laughs> don't judge, don't judge. <clears throat> anyway, once, you, uh, w w once it gets out there, then, um, you know, then, it's, then it's for sale. You're not allowed to give it away for free, though. You have to charge at least 99 cents. They want to make their money. So they get the lion's share of the, of the price. I set it to 99 cents, the absolute minimum. I wanted to give it away for free, right? And so I was pulling down a cool 30 cents a copy. Yeah, you know it. Um, it got around. Uh, it got really good reviews. People, people gave it good reviews. Uh, it started working its way up to the, um, into the top sellers list. It made it up to number one in sci-fi, number one in, in, a, in a few different categories. And that got the attention of Crown Publishing, which is an imprint of Random House. And there's an editor at Crown named Julian Pavia. And he was thinking about reading it. He wasn't sure. And he was talking to an, a colleague of his named David Fugate. And Julian said, like, well, I don't know if I should bother reading, you know, he's an editor, he's got to read a billion books all the time, and so he's like, I don't know if I should read this, it seems popular, but at the same time, it might just be kind of engineering porn, I don't know. And so he said, David, what do you think? And David said, well, I'll read it, and I'll, I'll let you know. So David read it, he liked it, and he said, yes, Julian, you should read it. Andy, do you need an agent? And so... I said, you know, after three years of not being able to get an agent, I, I, one comes knocking on my door. And so I'm like, yes. And then, so he became my agent, and then he turned around and said, hey, Julian, how much are you gonna give us for that book? <laughs> so that was cool. And then, so then we had a book deal going on. Um, you know, they were, they were negotiating the book deal. And then Fox came for the movie rights. 
<laughs> well, actually, he's not Fox. He's Simon Kinberg Productions. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Fox came for the movie rights right around the same time. And I'm like, oh, talk to my agent. <laughs> and so, so these negotiations were going on at the same time. The movie rights deal and the book deal were going on at the same time. Meanwhile, I'm still working as a software engineer. So I'm in my cubicle fixing bugs, then stepping away to take a call about my movie deal, and then coming back to my cubicle, finish up that bug. It was a very surreal time. Um, and in the end, the, the print deal and the film deal were agreed upon four days apart. So that was quite a week for me. <laughs> so then, um, then it was just really interesting to be a spectator in the whole movie making process. The book, the book went great. Um, you know, it got released, it, it, it made it to the New York Times bestseller list, and then, um, then later on, thank you, thank you, woo person. Um, <laughs> then when the paperback came out, it m made another appearance on the list. When that trailer came out, that's when it uh, bumped it up to number one. Thank you. That's what, that's what 10 million people seeing a trailer will do. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, it turns out there's a, sort of a correlation between a movie being made of your book and increased sales. Um, so... <laughs> Then, uh, but it's interesting, when, when they first come for your, uh, for your book, uh, movie studios buy film options like breath mints. I mean, they will buy hundreds of film options for every movie that actually gets made. So at the time they came for the movie rights, it wasn't like, oh wow, this is gonna be a movie. It's like, eh, we wanna make sure nobody else can buy it. <laughs> and then um, bit by bit, it just kept getting more and more likely. There's no point where you pop the champagne. It was just like, oh, Okay, um, we have Drew Goddard, who is a uh, you know big time Hollywood writer. He 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 wrote uh, Cloverfield. He directed Cabin in the Woods. He wrote a bunch of episodes of Buffy and Lost. He's a big name. He was going to write and direct it. So he wrote the screenplay, and then uh, he was set to direct. But then he got offered the director's chair for the next Spider-Man movie. So he left to do that. So and, and then right around the same time, Matt Damon took an interest in playing the lead. And the studio's like, that's interesting. That's something we care about. That's good to know. We, we want to know that. Now they have a star, but no director. And then Ridley Scott came in and said he'd direct. And the studio's like, that's interesting. <laughs> so that really made him stand up and take notice. And then things just started falling into place. And Aditya can tell you kind of some of the background there, but it's my understanding a lot of the stars worked for less than they would normally do because, uh, because they just wanted to be part of the project. So we got this unbelievable cast, and I'm just sitting there going, I don't know what the hell I did right. <laughs> but I'm glad. <laughs> uh, don't poke it. I don't know what's going <laughs> to... I'll, I'll be really honest. I mean, the, 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 the speed at which this came together is pretty unprecedented. And, you know, I knew Andy was a first-time uh, first novelist, and this is the first movie deal he had. And so every step of the way, I didn't want to get him too excited, but it was actually kind of incredible what was going on. So I would always downplay it with Andy a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and Andy's such a rational guy. He was like, well, let me just figure out the percentage chance of this actually being a real thing. And, uh, and then next thing you know, you know, we have this incredible cast, this incredible filmmaker in Ridley Scott, and hopefully a really great movie. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, speaking of which, I have something else to show. I don't know if you guys are interested. In <laughs> that is that Armenian oh, me okay that's gotta go in there hi kids uh, this is Mark Watney astronaut um, we're about six hours before our launch here on the Hermes and I've been asked by the good folks at NASA to introduce you to some of our crewmates here, uh, which I'm happy to do. So, hello Earthlings, uh, Mark Watney here. I'm your personal guide on this tour of the Hermes. Astronaut again. <laughs> Are you still rolling? This is pilot Rick Martinez doing the pre-flight checks. As you can see, he's using some pretty sophisticated math to get us to Mars. You got enough fingers there, Rick? I'm just balancing my checkbook. Hi there, I am Commander Melissa Lewis. Dr. Chris Beck, flight surgeon. Uh, my name is Alex Vogel. 
I am a German astronaut. I'm Beth Johansson, the computer expert. That's it. And psyched about going to Mars. Thanks. That's a hell of an answer. To the entire world. Uh, Gentlemen, why don't you tell the viewers what's cooking? Yolk, uh, something. Chewy. And you, Herr Vogel? Sausage. Uh, German? Wurst. It's awesome. Hello, Commander. Big year ahead. Maybe you could tell us what inspired you to take it all on. Uh, sure. Laura Clark, Chris McAuliffe, and, uh, of course, Eileen Collins. And you're not going to get a better answer than that. Seriously, though, Rick, how do we get there? Well, you basically point the bird in that direction. You wait 150 days, and 36 million miles later, we should be at Mars. Oh, wait. No, that's Uranus. Okay, that's Mars. Hey, you know, don't don't believe a word they say. You're one of the good ones. Thanks. Hey, wait, what? Who says that about me? This isn't over, you and me. We're gonna talk later. Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone, just a few minutes now before we leave for Mars. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your tour of the Hermes and see what a stellar crew we have. Say goodbye, crew. Goodbye, goodbye crew. crew. Everyone's a comedian. All right, we, we want to say goodbye. We want to wish everybody here on Earth an amazing year while we're gone. Let's go, Cubs. Uh, actually, how about, how about holding off on winning that world title till I'm back on Earth? Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Shut up. Martinez is a Yankee fan. Anyway, have a, have a wonderful year. Uh, just remember, what we do up there, we're, we're doing for everyone here on Earth. This is going to be an amazing journey for all of us. We're all in this together. Uh, Mom, Dad, love you. I'll miss you. And uh, first thing we do when we get back is uh, go to Gino's for some deep dish. All right, Watney out. All right, guys, I think we have time for a couple of questions. If uh, I don't know who has the mic. Anyone has any questions? Yeah, come to the mics in the center of the room. I was just <laughs> this is a bad dash. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Amanda. Um, I am a big fan of all of you guys and initially wanted to be you guys when I grew up. Discovered I was bad at math and then now want to be Andy when I grow up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, I'm, I'm glad I could be your silver medal. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the right track. <laughs> In being in the last panel and also the panel last year when Buzz Aldrin was here, which was also awesome, there's been kind of this somewhat discussion of how there's kind of this trend towards science fiction being more like science and the nerdy fanboys with their excuse me, that's not right. And one of my dreams is to be famous enough and have something successful enough that Neil deGrasse Tyson tells me I'm wrong on Twitter. <laughs> In going toward that goal, are there any resources you guys recommend for research, for writers, for people who are just interested in the stuff that isn't as publicly known, that we might not know about, stuff that a basic Google search wouldn't turn up? A more detailed Google search. <laughs> like, yeah. Basically, uh, um, when I wrote The Martian, I didn't know anyone in aerospace. I was, I was on my own. Uh, it took me about three years. I probably spent about half that time researching, and all of it was just Google. Like, seriously. And about 90% of the results ended up being Wikipedia pages. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it's all out there. It's just, you know, you got, you, you got to dig it up. Cool. Yeah, the internet really provides an unbelievable resource to be able to do a, a, a phenomenal amount of original research at a level. Uh, and as what Andy has done, of course, is always check a lot of those facts too, um, and and so it uh, you know it's a library at your home, can't beat it. Thank you so much. Hi, my question is more for Todd. Uh, when SpaceX unfortunately had their anomaly last week, 
The Dragon spaceship actually survived um, the explosion, but they weren't able to deploy the parachutes because that would be inside the capsule and deployed by astronauts. For Orion's um, abort capabilities, um, will ground control be able to deploy parachutes in the case of an anomaly? Uh, I think for the Orion abort, um, that's going to be done uh, by, the, by the crew. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, there's very few signals between the rocket and Orion itself. It, the rocket can say, I'm, I'm having a bad day, uh, you need to get off. <laughs> <laughs> and quickly. Yeah, but essentially it's designed so that the, the launch abort system pulls away from the rocket and, and, and then the, the chutes deploy and bring it home safely. Good question. <laughs> you're, you're, you're particularly invested in that knowledge. Of <laughs> Hello. Wow, okay, you guys are all so cool. Okay, so uh, Andy, yours is my new favorite book now. Thank you. I'm getting it signed on Saturday. Okay. Um, but uh, By Andy? <laughs> yeah. By, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I, there's this guy outside, he gave me $3 if he wanted to sign it, but um, the question is more for the three of you in the middle who, according to Andy, actually put your pants on and you're home. I also um, put my pants on. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's four. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, so... <laughs> he does. Zipper. <laughs> I don't and need Velcro. to see. I don't need to see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but... Based on all of the calculations I know Andy did for this and all of his, you know, beta readers, beta readers, do you think that this book could kind of be a more, like, before you go to Mars book to read for the astronauts who actually end up going to Mars? Like, this is the worst case scenario, be prepared type of thing? I will tell you this, about a year ago, uh, at which I was already a consultant on the film and had been doing a few things, I, I went to JSC and I gave a talk uh, at, at, uh, to the astronaut corps and, and then uh, later on in that day I had an opportunity to talk to the center director who was also an astronaut, Ellen Ochoa. And the first thing I did when I sat down and we just chit-chatted, I said, hey, have you read The Martian? And she goes, no, I haven't read The Martian. So I told her a little bit about it, and that, that was it. And about two months later, I get this fabulous email from Ellen. Jim, I read The Martian. It's now required reading. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's yeah. your answer. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have a reading list, and it is on it. It's, uh, it's flown around the office. It's a great read. And I think it's just indicative, you know, in society at large, I mean, the Big Bang Theory. Uh, you know, the, there are lots of indicators that this movie, the success of the book, uh, that we want our intellect challenged as well as our emotion. And so I think it's, uh, it's a great question that you asked, and most of us have read it. I loved it. Thanks. <laughs> so I'll, I'll add one more thing to that. In our world, we're pretty OCD about all the things that could go wrong, um, but a lot of us all went to the same schools and learned the same types of things. One, one of the things about uh, artists and authors and things like that um, are that they think differently about problems. And one of the things I said about scientists and engineers complimenting each other, um, the fact that um, Mark Watney was a botanist, he, he solved the problem of how to get food for himself. Um, so that um, this idea of being able to crowdsource um, um, information in a way that your normal engineering going to see things, I think, gives you a better solution. And so from that perspective, I agree. I think it should be required reading. Uh, I'm a big fan. You guys probably uh, have heard of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, of this new movement. So there's a new movement called STEAM, right? And you add the arts to it. Add the arts, absolutely. And, and so there's an aspect to me of design beauty in the, in the A portion of STEAM that we really do need. And so, Andy, I, I'm, for one, and I think most of the problems we can run into, you've probably thought about already. So if, if we don't have the book, you're probably going to be in mission control um, <laughs> helping us uh, as a liaison. We'll probably be on the, on the ticket here. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. Well, thanks. Just, uh, just one final thought on that. Um, uh, just. Just to, people often ask me, ooh, does you know, NASA ask your advice on this stuff? I'm like, guys, <laughs> I, I'm an enthusiast. These guys are experts. There is a big difference. <laughs> All, my, my job is just to entertain you guys, and um, I hope I do that. 
But there's a, a huge gulf of knowledge and training between me and the people who actually know what they're doing. And so don't, don't draw a false equivalency here. <laughs> That's all. All right, I think we have time for one last question. I just want to thank you guys because we're a race of explorers and we haven't been as aggressive as we could be and now you're putting some real feet to this. So thanks for getting us out to our sister planets. Welcome. The uh, internet has been abuzz with the Mars mission regarding solar radiation and solar storms. Can you address what protections to the crew so that uh, they make it to Mars and back? <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So uh, indeed, uh, one of the things that we've done when uh, we send things to Mars is uh, have radiation detectors on them so that we understand the environment they're in. And we also do original research in how to protect uh, humans uh, from cell damage. And, and it turns out there's now a variety of materials. There's even uh, concepts of uh, uh, being encased in water. Uh, the, the, of course, what we're doing is we constantly look at the sun. We constantly predict when another flare will occur, when another coronal mass ejection will occur, which does indeed accelerate particles to high energies and could harm people that are, that are in the capsule. And so our forecasting ability is also getting much better. So all, th all these things are pointing in the right direction. And uh, as our scientists learn to forecast and as our uh, medical researchers learn how to protect the body. Uh, that's converging, I believe, into some uh, concrete plans that we'll, that we'll be using as we go to Mars. We also have operational limits on how much time you can spend in space. And so uh, there's also the mitigation of, you know, once you've spent so many days in space, you're, you're limited to uh, uh, how much more flying you can do. And that's something that we watch closely. And we're definitely going to have to reevaluate and think about how we do that, but it's to minimize the risk of lifelong problems to the, to the crew member. So there's also operational constraints that we put to mitigate that, par that problem. Indications are from the radiation detector on the uh, Curiosity mission as it went to Mars, uh, once we've analyzed the data, that it is a survivable trip. Uh, there's an increased risk in cancer. Both ways, right? Both, Both ways. ways, okay. <laughs> Well, you know, NASA does take that philosophy. This is another thing I really like about the book, and that is indeed, we don't plan on leaving anyone there. Uh, so it is, a, it is a, a plan to be able to go, but also to return. Yeah. And that's a, a critical element of the whole NASA philosophy. All right, well, I got it. Want it, Jim? So uh, uh, not to have a spoiler, but indeed there's a capability that we've put out on the web. It's called Mars Track. If you go to the NASA booth and, and uh, pick up one of these brochures, you can uh, go through your browser and be able to uh, browse Mars at, at reasonably high resolution. We're constantly improving it. And uh, Mark Watney's trip is, uh, is going to be available for you to also take that journey. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Give it up for this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Go see The Martian, October 2nd. But even more, let's go to Mars. Thank you. Let's go to Mars. <laughs>